Well, good morning and blessings to you all from Shenandoah. I want to start out by speaking on behalf of the church, and we do really appreciate your prayers and your support. And yeah, the offering for this morning, I guess it's going to be coming up to us. We really appreciate that. And all you've done for us, we appreciate your presence. When you are able to come up, feel free to come up anytime. Um, it definitely is, definitely is a, a good work. Um, and as I'm sure most of you are aware, it's not an easy work, um, but it is a good work, and we are blessed with the group we have up there. When I look back on my life, I'm guessing you've probably done this at some point or another, and look at where you, maybe where you have been and where you are. Hopefully there's some significant change. When I look at where I am now, 10 years ago, was not on my agenda whatsoever. Being up here was not something that I ever even considered. City ministry was something I would have never thought I'd be interested in. Um, as a child, city life was, I guess if you want to say unthinkable, like that was not even in the realm of possibility. Um, yeah, you just, you didn't do that. You didn't live in the city. And obviously that's changed. I live right in the town of Shenandoah. Um, several of you have been there. And it's a good place if that's where you're supposed to be. City life is a good place to be. And if you get the opportunity, if it's your calling, don't shy away from it simply because it's living in the city. There are challenges. There are pressures around us, maybe ungodly neighbors, um, my oldest son is going to be seven here in a few months. He's starting to interact more with the city children, and that brings a set of challenges. Um, it's just something that needs to be watched. There's things that need to be taught. But not growing up in the city, I was faced with a lot of the same challenges, maybe in different ways, different times. But... It's not something simply not living around people is going to keep you from. Being on a ministry team was never part of my thoughts either. Something I never really considered. I don't know if Kurt Martin is here or not. I didn't tell him I was going to call him out. Kurt and Sheila, I don't know if he's here or not. But I worked with him back when I was a teenager. Maybe 12 years ago or so. And I'm guessing he would have never thought that we would go to church together. Um, yeah, maybe he did, but I didn't. Um, Kurt and I had a lot of good times together, some, maybe some struggles too sometimes, but um, all in all, we got along. But God is good, and he is still in the business of changing lives. And I want to say it's only by his grace and his mercy that I am who I am today. If I look back 12, maybe 13 years ago, yeah, things were a lot different. And it's only through the grace of God that I can be who I am today, and I praise him for that. My message title this morning is, Are You in Control? I'm going to go to James chapter 3. That is the message on the tongue. One disclaimer before I start is just because I'm going to be talking about the tongue does not mean I have it all, I have it all down. Um, in fact, it's quite the opposite, I want to say. It's something that I need to work on. Um, it was good for me to study, something I need to um, definitely, definitely need to work on in my life. So it's good for me to study, and I want to bring it to you. Before I read the text, I want to look at how important are our words? Are our words really that significant? I told you I'm going to go to James chapter 3, but first I want to flip to Matthew 12. A few verses I want to look at there on maybe just how important our words are. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. 
says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account of in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou art justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. We're judged by our words. And we're either going to be justified or we're going to be condemned. Now, this is not going to say that we are saved by saying only kind words. Like if we can manage to never um, talk bad about somebody, that's what saves us. Absolutely not. That's not what I'm trying to get at. It is only through the blood of Christ that we can even have control of our tongue. It's only through the blood of Christ that we are saved. It is the great promise that he has given to all those who call on him. Unkind or careless words should bring conviction regardless of the incident or if the one receive, on the receiving end deserves it or not. We're pretty good at um, justifying ourselves why we said something when we did. Uh, maybe somebody threw something at you or said something bad about you and it just it's the right timing to bring it back. Um, and I think as a Christian we can't, we can't view it that way. Unkind or careless words should bring conviction. They should bring us to a, a sense of, of guilt. Because we can be condemned by our words. Because our words are coming from what's in our heart. And I'm going to look at that some more. James chapter 3, the, verse, the first 12 verses. Verse 1 says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For of every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. I have two points. My first one is the power of our words. The second one is exposed by our words. Um, under the first point, I have maybe two subpoints, if you want to call them. Um, I'm going to look first at the power of our words. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it eat its fruit. So our words have strength, a lot of strength. The ability to speak life and death. And when I say that, I'm not talking about maybe raising somebody life or causing somebody to die simply by our words, but through the building up and the tearing down, speaking encouragement or speaking um, negatively, downgrading. Second half of that verse says those, or says those who love it eat its fruit. Those who use it a lot must be prepared to take the consequences. And we dare say we all tend to use our tongues a lot, some more than others. But if, we are, if we're going to use it, we have to be prepared for its consequences. Consequences can be good or they can be bad. It just depends if we're speaking life or death. There is consequences on both ends. Our words are influential. The first verse says, Be not many masters, translated in some other 
um, versions, be not many teachers. Cautions against becoming a teacher. This does not give you the, the um, disclaimer or the excuse to say that you're not going to teach Sunday school. It's not to neglect one's calling or to even try doing it. But rather, it's a warning, looking, it's a warning to those looking to promote self. Ones that have an agenda or the wrong motive. Somebody that is wanting to get up front to promote their own thing, think they've, they have something that they want to share. Um, looking to build themselves up. We looked at pride a little bit in the Sunday, or that was the, the um, what our Sunday school lesson was about. We looked at pride, and it's promoting self. It's a wrong, it's a wrong motive. But maybe the, the teacher doesn't have that wrong motive. Maybe they are, maybe they do feel they're humble, and that's, that's a good thing. But there's still a warning against teachers, or two teachers. The second half of the verse says, we shall receive the greater condemnation. And that is the reason he cautions cheat teachers. I'm not saying that nobody should be a teacher. We need teachers. We need leaders. But there's a caution. There's a greater judgment. Our words have influence. And a teacher or a leader is responsible for their followers. For those that follow after, that leader is responsible for them. So who is a leader or a teacher? Maybe that isn't necessarily your title. I'll ask this question. Does anyone look up to you? Might someone be watching how you act or talk? If you influence somebody by your actions or the way you talk, we can all take heed to what James talks about in the rest of the chapter, or we should, because we're influencing by our words. Now, everyone has to make their own decisions, but if someone strays due to our influence, the Bible has a serious warning for that. And what I mean by that is people making their own decisions, we can talk, we can um, teach, but ultimately, just because of the way somebody turned out doesn't, we've we got we to be careful. We don't pin it all on ourselves as far as um, maybe the teaching was good and somebody strayed. Um, everybody has to make their own decisions. Um, it's not all on us, but our influence is very strong. And if we are teaching false doctrine and somebody is strayed due to that is when we are held accountable. Matthew 8, 6, 18, 6 says, But who shall, who shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me? It were better that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Some pretty um, radical um, things he uses there. Or better that that man were dead than he would offend. I know he's talking about children there, but believers in, in general. Somebody caused one of them to stray. It were better that that man hadn't lived or that he were drowned. Moving on. Apparently the tongue is the hardest part of the body to control. And I'm not totally sure what he has in mind here. Some commentary suggests that um, if you can control the the tongue, you can control any um, part of your body, whether it's your thought life, maybe your appetite, whatever it might be, you got that if you have your tongue completely under control. Obviously, Jesus is the only one that has done that to perfection. Um, He is our perfect example. Then James likens the tongue to a bit in a horse's mouth or a rudder on a ship or a boat. So he draws some analogies. I don't know much about horses. I never had one. I've ridden one maybe once. I remember riding a pony one time and it didn't behave very well, but maybe that was because I didn't know how to handle it or maybe it wasn't well trained. I'm not sure. It was a long time ago. But the bit was put in its mouth. You had the reins and you tried to steer it that way. And that was supposed to work and it did, did work for some of them. It's not very well for me. But um, 
just a small piece. What he's getting at is that small piece in the horse's mouth puts pressure on the sides and the horse turns. So the horse is generally a big animal, but just a little tug is gonna just direct the horse one way or the other. And then he also draws the analogy of the rudder on the ship, the flapper in the back that directs the, um, just the, moves the water behind the ship. The whole boat moves just with the, the flip of this, this rudder. It depends how big the boat is, but a small motor boat, you sit in the back with it, you have a handle, you flip it back and forth, the boat steers one way or the other. Um, bigger boats, it's a steering wheel. And studying it a little bit, the rudder is not always used, but um, in the smaller boats, it is. Um, I read somewhere about Queen Elizabeth. It is a, if I understood correctly, a British cruise ship, I think. Big boat, regardless. The weight of that boat was approximately 84,000 tons, and the rudder was 140 tons. So about two-tenths of a percent of what the entire boat weighed. And when that rudder was flipped from one side to the other, the big cruise ship moved at its direction. What he's bringing out here is we all understand the bit and the rudder are very small pieces. So is the tongue, a very small piece, very small part of our body. I didn't break down the weight of the tongue versus the weight of the, the body, but significantly smaller, a lot smaller. Um, but the tongue is very controlling, and what comes from our mouth doesn't necessarily control the physical direction of our body, but has it, plays a very large part on the direction of our life. The tongue is small, but what comes from it has much power, like I had mentioned earlier, possibly life or death. Words can be destructive. Looking at the second half of verse 5, it says, Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth, or how great a forest a little fire kindleth. It's um, similarities in a spark and a careless or a critical word. I believe you would all agree fire is a good thing. I'm sure you all take turn enjoying fire, especially this time of year. Um, fire is good for heat regardless of what you um, heat your house with, other than electric, which I do some of. Um, anything that you have to burn takes fire, and we appreciate that. We would miss it. The other, I think it was last week, I let my oil tank run out, and it was no longer heating. Um, the fire was no longer working. The fire had nothing to burn, and the house got cold. I was very glad once there was oil and something to burn, spark, and just like that, my house is warm again. We like fire for light, not used as often as, or as, as much as it had been um, a while back, 100 years or so. We have our electricity, but fire was used for light, whether it's a torch or a candle, whatever it might be. Um, we use fire for fun, campfires. I thoroughly enjoy sitting around a campfire, um, especially when you're out camping. Um, or to burn trash. Can't do that in Shenandoah, but I did it before we moved up. You had a pile of trash, and half an hour later, there wasn't much left. I was glad for the fire to remove what I didn't want. That's fire in its restrained state. Unrestrained, it can be very devastating. Currently, Australia is dealing with some massive fire, uh, wildfires. Um, I couldn't get an exact number, but approximately 15 to 20 million acres has been burned up to this point. Now, I also read they just got some rain. There's some of it's under control, but still a large amount of this wildfire is just burning out of control. A large part of Australia is not appreciating the fire right now. That fire didn't start all of a sudden big and booming. It started small, smart, started with a spark. There's some speculation that could have been arson that started at least some of it. 
Um, and that was not a big fire when it started. It started small, whether it was a match or a torch, whatever the whatever was lighted with, lit with, um, it was small. And it just became something big, and out of control, out of hand. Words can destroy. Looked at fire, how it is helpful, brings life, brings heat, um, and how it can also destroy. And words do the same. Words can destroy. They can tarnish a reputation. They can destroy relationships in moments that took years to build. Trust is so hard to build, so easy to destroy. It's going to take a long time for the forests of Australia to come back. Um, good chance they will. After a while, there could be some permanent scarring. And likewise, our words can have a very lasting effect. And I believe when we realize how much of a lasting effect, maybe some of you have seen it personally, lasting effects, maybe some of you feel it, lasting effects of critical words that have a damaging effect, permanent scarring, something that will probably never go away. Um, how destructive our words can be. Verse 7, it says about beasts, birds, and serpents being tamed. Um, many strong and dangerous animals have been tamed and used productively. Um, the elephant, the camel, they've both been brought under submission. They've been used for um, valuable things, obviously not here in the United States, but um, African countries, they've, they've used them as we use horses. And elephants can lift. Heavy loads, they use them, use them productively. Camels have been used for transportation back in Bible times. Birds have been tamed. Birds have been um, trained to talk. Certain ones have been um, taught to talk. And it brings the analogy of the tongue, something we're so familiar with, but no man can tame the tongue. I want to emphasize a little bit that no man can tame the tongue. It is only through, it is only through, um, only God, only Jesus, through Jesus that we can bring our tongue under submission. I just want to put that in there. No man can tame the tongue on our own. It's our natural tendency to tear others down in order to promote self. Another word for that is mudslinging. Mudslinging always defiles the thrower. It's used to defile somebody else, oftentimes to make myself not look so bad because he has more dirt on than I do. But in order to throw mud, you first have to pick it up and most likely you're making yourself muddier. Mudslinging always causes grief. It never causes peace. I could not think of a time when somebody said something degrading and it turned out to the one he was degrading said, oh yeah, you're right. That's right. No, it's when it's brought in a critical attitude and then it's brought with dirt. It never brings peace. Second point, exposed by our words. The last half of, in Matthew 12, verse 34, it says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now we hear more on how what we say is what comes from our heart. And ultimately, that's, that's what it is, our Mouth is not just speaking by itself. It has a source. It's coming from somewhere, and it is our heart. Our words are an outpouring of what's in our heart. What we put in our heart or mind will come out of our mouth. And you could say, well, maybe not. We have, we are, we're good at being hypocritical, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So what we put in our heart or mind will come out of our mouth, and this is good news. While we will always war against the flesh, a heart after God will also be exposed. When we think of being exposed, we think of something negative. But a heart after God will also be exposed. That will, definitely should, come out of our mouth. It will come out of our mouth if it is in our heart. And like I mentioned earlier, when there's failure, it should bring conviction. And if it does, that means you are sensitive to the Spirit. 
It is fairly easy to appear righteous when we are conscious of who we are around. Going back to what is in, to what's in our heart will come out in our mouth. It's pretty easy to appear righteous when we're conscious of who we're around. But it's when we're caught off guard is when the heart is most accurately revealed. There's a story I read uh, a long time ago. Some of you may have heard it. It is back. I, I don't know if the story is exactly true or not. It doesn't change the, the moral of the story. Back in World War II, there was a draft. And this man, his name was John. He was a Mennonite. And he went, he was called before the draft board. It was his turn to go in. He went in. And there was a long line. He's standing in line thinking, oh my, this is going to be a while. And another man comes up behind him and starts chatting with him. He's like, yeah, the man that came behind John, I don't know there was a name. Said, I was going to be here earlier, but ah, my neighbor's pigs got out of their pen and came over to my yard. They rooted stuff up and just made a mess out of stuff. I had to, obviously had to get them under control and get them back to him and now I'm late. Now I get to stand in line for a while. John's like, yeah, wow, that would be a mess. I'd go over to that neighbor and I'd tell him what's up. Tell him that he's paying for these damages and that he's going to, he's going to clean it up, he's going to pay for it, and that is that. More or less the end of the conversation. The line moves forward. It's eventually John's turn in front of the, in front of the um, officer on duty. And officer says... John steps front, officer says, it is, ar- is it Army or Navy? And John says, conscientious objector. Sergeant was, it was, this was not an unheard status, but it's kind of made, uh, they, they didn't like it. The officer looks up and says, and says, do you have a reason? And John says, religious beliefs. Pretty, pretty simple. About that time, the man that was, that he had chatted with about the pigs, came up behind him and said, Officer, this, this man is not a conscientious objector. Not at all. And he pulls out his badge. He was an officer in the Army as well. I believe he did this intentionally. He, and he, re, he repeated the story to the officer. Said, this man is not a conscientious objector. There's no reason for a CO status. At the end of the story, John went out with and enlisted in the Army. John was condemned by his words. Outward appearance, he probably did look like a conscientious objector. That's not what was in his heart. He was caught off guard. This man asked him, related a story to him. John gave him how what he would do with it, and it proved he was not. He wasn't opposed to conflict or to war like he said he was. Maybe he thought he was, but that's not what was in his heart. We bless God, and... Hopefully you've done some of that already this morning. Through prayer, through singing, upbuilding conversation. These are good things. We were created that we would voluntarily glorify our creator and Lord. As Christians, this should be our normal conversation and through life. Shouldn't it be? We bless God all the time. Remember at the, the, very, uh, the first two words in James 3 says, my brethren. He's speaking to the choir, if you will. Um, well, I understand that he is maybe speaking to his disciples, speaking to, to ones that are probably already believing, that should know. But in here he says, We bless God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. We curse men made in the similitude of God. And maybe you say, well, that's easy. I don't curse at people. Hopefully you don't. But I have the question, or do I, or do you? Now, I'm not implying that anybody here does this, but social media has become a major platform for degrading and downright cruel and threatening remarks. I'm sure you're all aware of that. And social media can go to any type of, well, I feel, 
it's not considered social media, but even, even texting. Saying something is a whole lot easier to do when you're writing it out and pushing send than actually saying to somebody's face. And a lot more harmful things have been said through a written message and a verbal message. Suicides have been li linked to Facebook posts where a person was bullied to the point of feeling worthless, been told they're worthless multiple times, whatever it might be. Um, there have been cases that have been searched and it appears that through, through this person, through uh, conversations on social media that it's what drove him to this point. Verse 10 says, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. We cannot serve two masters. We can only be part of one kingdom. I'm sure you've heard that many times. And you've probably heard this already too. On January 3rd, 2020, this year, our U.S. military um, did a drone strike on over in Iraq, I think I'm saying his name right, Qassam Soleimani. He, is an Iran uh, he was an Iranian terrorist. They killed him. The U.S. military did this. He's an Iranian terrorist. terrorist. He's responsible for thousands of deaths, largely throughout the Middle East. At least 600 Americans have been killed by him. This was a very bad man. He was known for terror. And our country took him out. Our military took him out. It's a pretty hot topic, depending who you talk to. And the question I have is, can I applaud the work of the military and still be blessing God? Remember, this man killed a lot of people. Can I applaud the work of the military and still be blessing God? I'm not going to say I have an answer for that. It's a very touchy subject. Solomani was also made in the image of God. Maybe that'll bring some clarification to what our answer should be. But I want to challenge that too. We probably know what our answer should be. But remember, what comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart. Can we claim non-resistance if we cheer on the military? If we are good with what they do. I'm going to go back to the story that I, on the story that John, he obviously didn't really, he didn't appear very non-resistant, but he probably would have, he claimed non-resistance. He said he's a CO, conscientious objector to the military. His life did, or his words did not speak it. There is a lot of political drama and it dominates a lot of conversation these days. We're in, the, in an election year, and it brings a lot of conversation. And I'll admit I, I enjoy following it. Um, it's very interesting. But I need to be very careful that when I follow the news, that I need to remember that God is in control. Ultimately, God is in control. He places leaders in the time that he sees fit. He has set up some very wicked leaders. You can go back to the Bible. Um, multiple times um, of where God has set up a very wicked leader to do what he has had planned. It was all part of his plan. Um, and I also need to remember that the church and state are to remain separate. Something that we are seeing in the United States, I think, intermingling a lot, especially since the days of Trump. Trump recently had a rally in Miami. It was called Evangelicals for Trump. It's kind of, um, it's kind of eye-opening if you watch it. And I think we need to be very careful. I don't know that we need to shut off from all news about what's going on. Um, I kind of enjoy knowing what's going on, I, but I do need to be careful that I don't draw an opinion. It's very hard not to do. 
a lot of controversy um, in a lot of controversy in politics. Church and state are to remain separate, and there is a lot of intermingling going on. There's a lot of churches backing Trump, claiming Christianity. Some, not as much anymore, would even claim non-resistance. Yet, they want to have a political poll. They don't think that's what Jesus had in mind. Some German Mennonites backed Hitler before they saw his true colors. I recently listened to a podcast on Anabaptist Financial. I don't remember who they were interviewing, um, but he read a script that the um, some German Mennonites, I don't know that it's a blanket statement for all German Mennonites, I kind of doubt it, um, but they would have sent Hitler a letter stating, giving their support. They were, they were behind what he's doing, they thought this is a good thing, and it didn't go real long. Several years later they realized that they were in the wrong party. Some things seem pretty obvious in our political state today, but be careful. Be careful where you put your allegiance because we can only have allegiance in one kingdom. The kingdom of this world or the kingdom of heaven. Claiming non-resistance in word but not in heart is hypocrisy. Jesus had some harsh words for the hypocritical Pharisees and he still hates hypocrisy. So, to conclude... I don't want to de- I'm not trying to depress anyone over the difficult job of controlling the tongue. It is important and it's a constant battle, but we are not alone. Jesus is here to help and he is here to guide. So my encouragement is to you is to commit your life to him, study his example, and pattern your life after him. Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Come what may in the coming days, the coming years, um, God's promises still stand true. God is for us. He is not against us. Christ has already defeated sin and death. Go and live in victory. It's victory over, over the tongue. It is a piece of us that the devil uses to exploit his agenda, and he does it very effectively. But Christ has already defeated sin and death. Christ has gave us the way that we can have victory. Go and live in victory. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you this morning, and we thank you for who you are, for the warnings you've given in your word. Lord, just help us to take heed, to put into our heart healthy things that ultimately we can bring forth good fruit, fruit that is upbuilding to those around us. Lord, we thank you for the power that you've given to us through your death, the Holy Spirit, Give us power over our tongue. Lord, I just bless each one here. I pray that our conversation going forth could be upbuilding to you, glorifying you, and just pray that we could be a light to those we come in contact with in the upcoming days. pray this all in your name. Amen.